Once again, I, I want to, you know, good afternoon. I want to welcome you to our series today. And uh, it's a pleasure for me, and of course, indeed, a great privilege to welcome Dixon Batwa, and uh, who is the founder and uh, president of Wireless. You're wondering what is Wireless? It's Youth Learning a Citizen, Environmental uh, a Citizen and Environmental Scientist, which seeks to develop citizens with uh, scientific habits of mind. Uh, Dixon is joined today by his wife, uh, Susan Batra. She's right at the back. Let's give them a round of applause. Welcome to the here. And they actually met back in, uh, way back in the college. I no, think. no, high Not school. High school, met in high school, and fell in love, and things start, started moving from that point on. So it's, it's, I know he has a lot of things to tell about it. So he's going to talk about his own journey, which is uh, making the making of a science bureaucrat with a vision and leadership. Uh, his story is fascinating, as you are going to hear, and we are looking forward to hearing how he found his way uh, to NASA Goddard Space Flight Center back in 1976. That's way back when, you know, and how he transitioned from research uh, to management, uh, which was triggered by a detail to NASA headquarters in 1978 at a time of a transition at headquarters and also brought about by a Congressional Science Fellowship. And <laughs> very fascinating, story. but more importantly, he's going to shed light on his uh, involvement in various efforts in the launch and evolution, uh, evolution but more importantly, he's going to shed light on his involvement in various efforts in the launch and the evolution of the Earth uh, system science. And this is well documented in a couple of interviews he gave back in uh, 2009, June 25. He also gave another one, uh, March 26 in 2010 and June 3, 2010. So it's a very fascinating story how all this thing got formed and his detour from here to headquarters, very interesting stuff that I actually was able to read in... Uh, is uh, there's, there's a historical all of history so very fascinating story so with that ladies and gentlemen please help me welcome our speaker dixon batra <laughs> thank you thank you wow well you know it's interesting at, at goddard i would introduce myself primarily as the person who led the planning of the earth observing system what, roughly a third of this center probably works on things derived from that new start, which is pretty incredible when you look at it, but things didn't always look like they were going to be that incredible. Um, in my talk, I mean, in the setup for this talk, there was a, a lot of sense of talk about your journey, talk about things that would help young career scientists or others at NASA and maybe even beyond figure out or at least relax a little as they pursue their careers and look for what opportunities occur. Uh, I'll do that, but maybe not quite just literally. I will just do it by telling a story in his, more or less in historical order. Uh, and I'm, I guess I'm not supposed to be embarrassed that it's my story. Um, so forgive me some of it, but in my case, the personal, the private, and the public got very intertwined in curious ways, and you'll hear some of that in what I tell you today. So, as I was preparing for this talk and thinking back through things, uh, one of the first things that came up was I was about to be a high school junior, and I was persuaded to apply for a program, an NSF Winter Institute in Computer Programming that it would take place at a, a college uh, near my home, a college being Randolph-Macon, then men's college. And I grew up with Susan uh, in Richmond, Virginia. So uh, it turned out the acceptance letter was life transforming. I mean, I'd never seen a letter like this. Uh, the man who chose the people who got, the, got it, admitted to this, and this was basically Sorry, in sexist old days, this was an all-male uh, program, and it was aimed at boys who lived up and down I-95 between Richmond and Washington. Um, that was just the nature of it. 
And in it, uh, the man, the professor had um, arranged for funding for 24, and he had 120 applications. And the acceptance letter, you know, basically made you feel like, oh my God, you must be like God's gift to have gotten chosen. <laughs> and it was pretty amazing. And it came at a time when my self-image was changing pretty quickly, uh, and for the egotistical, but also for the better. Um, anyway, in the course of that, in 19, beginning in 1965, I began to learn to program in Fortran. And the other thing that was amazing about it is intimidating as it, the acceptance letter had been about everybody, it turned out, although I'm sure I was not the smartest person there or the one with the best academic record, I was by far the best programmer. I was a better programmer than any of the professor's college students and just went crazy. And I loved it. I've never found a work activity more gratifying than programming. I know that seems weird, but that's the way it was. Uh, here in the basement of uh, where our supercomputer used to be, in the basement, I guess, of building two, I think, um, as I would run my model, they would have on the radio, and I looked so I, I got so I could sing all the lyrics to look for the union label, which they were playing all the time. Anyway, that's the International Ladies Garment Workers uh, theme song. Anyway, I need to skip ahead a lot because I want to cover a lot in an hour. The next big thing I wrote myself a note to, to bring up is Susan and I got married between sophomore and junior years of college. We got married between our 20th birthdays. And the importance of that will come up somewhat later on, but it was a wonderful thing and it uh, was certainly a transformative event. Susan's parents uh, had, were over there, over our lives, extremely generous to us, to me. I even got taken to New York with them as the high school boyfriend. I still look back at that and can't imagine, but it was great and uh, it exposed to me to all kinds of things. Because we were married, I felt I should be very grown up and responsible. And so I went to my undergraduate advisor and asked him for a job. And I got a 12 hour a week job working for his particle physics research group at the Cambridge Electron Accelerator. There'd been an explosion of the accelerator, so the graduate students were mostly a lot older. Uh, one of them took four years to get his PhD, two of them took eight years, and the remaining four took seven. So mostly these people were that much older than I was. I mean, they graduated the same year I graduated, but you know, they were seven and eight years older, Several, most of them, I guess, were married, and um, a variety of things happened, but um, it was quite it was quite something. By the way, uh, any of you who've dealt with um, gamma ray astronomy, uh, Claude Canizares was the one who got out in four years, um, and one of them, who was really sort of the most worldly wise and savvy, uh, after watching me, and and by the way, this group took Susan and I into their social scene after a while, even though we were you know so much younger, and they were being living in Cambridge with Julia Child had become unbelievably good cooks, and we acquired a lifetime interest in good cooking from them, and you know did things like, or were counted in Julia and Julie, uh, where we you know cooked through the parts of the chicken chapter in Mastering the Art of French Cooking. But the key thing that happened, because I'd always thought I'd be a particle physicist, and I was prepared to be an experimental particle physicist even though computer programming was the skill that was still carrying me forward. I'm not going to tell you the reasons he counseled me out of particle physics, but um, Gary Feldman was the graduate student's name. He subsequently was eventually the chairman of the physics department at Harvard. And Gary basically said, look, Dixon, y y you're not going to cut it in this field, and even if you do, you're not going to like it. So. With that, and one semester as an undergraduate left, I went looking for something else to do with my technical background, and in thumbing through the course catalog, there was a course called Upper Atmospheres of Planets. 
I never even thought of there being an upper atmosphere. Um, that was all strange and new, and I giggled. I mean, it literally made me laugh. I went and started taking the course from Alex Dalgarno. I also found another course, which was quantum mechanics of atoms and molecules with special applications to upper atmospheres of planets, taught by Michael B. McElroy. It was his first course at Harvard that he ever taught. And uh, I was there the first day when he was sort of sitting absentmindedly uh, in the front row. He was a uh, bright, flaming red hair. And he was only 33 years old, even though he had a tenured full professorship. And he didn't look, and he looked youthful. And so normally at Harvard, you waited seven minutes, and then the lecture started. Well, seven minutes came and went. When it got to 10 minutes, one of the somewhat wise guy graduate students stood up and said, would the real Professor McElroy please stand up? At which point, Mike stood up and began to lecture. It, it broke him out of whatever stray thoughts he was having, and that was his course. It was a pretty astounding way to begin, but that was the beginning of his teaching career at Harvard. So at any rate, I found Aronomy, and I liked it. And that ultimately led to a PhD thesis on the ionosphere of Venus. What a modest title. My master's degree was on the night side ionosphere of Venus, and I don't recommend reading it. At um, any rate, the, um, that got me through graduate school, but what I mostly did was numerical modeling, Fortran programming, and so that was still carrying me through. And, and when I say good at it, what it really, I think most of you who've ever dealt with programming know that productivity varies widely. There are people who can code hundreds of times faster than other people. And in my case, what it came down to is I tended to catch my key punching mistakes, for those of you who even know what a key punch is. But it's how you type your program in, in the days before all kinds of terminals and systems. Um, and I would, eat, I would tend to not make mistakes or catch my mistakes, and I didn't make logical errors. So basically, I got fast turnarounds. And then here at Goddard, by and large, it was hard to get more than one turnaround of a program a day at the main computer. Uh, so clearly, if you got it right and didn't have to wade through time and time again of mistakes or logic errors or whatever, you could be, in addition to being able to code quickly, you could actually produce much more in terms of results. And in my case, when we came to Goddard, I was given um, a program that already existed in BASIC uh, and was running on a calculator. And we joined Goddard, if I remember correctly, in May. I arrived, and by August, we were at a scientific meeting with the results of that model because I not only converted it, but we'd run it thousands of times because it was a toy model. In any case, at this point I wrote myself a note, and here's where the personal begins to come in, in weird ways. Um, Susan and I, um, Susan became acquainted with people who had done interracial adoptions when we were undergraduates. It was a story she, would, as a journalism major, was doing. And she realized that the folks there were our folks. So. We went there to a meeting. She took me to a meeting, and the rest ensued. We ultimately, in Houston, while I was in graduate, well, in graduate school for one and just out of graduate school for the other, we adopted two African-American children, one at 13 months and one at four months and a week, and uh, life changes. So, at any rate, I will stow that away for a minute. Uh, how did I get to Goddard? Well. Rice let me do a PhD in ionospheric modeling of Venus, which was not the field of expertise of anybody on the faculty. Don't ever let anybody do that. It's a really bad idea to let some graduate student wander off and do a PhD in a field without any representation amongst the faculty. I got ready to defend my thesis. I was pretty confident. I baked Ischel tartlets, little wonderful almond cookies, uh, and uh, had milk ready for the, uh, for the uh, committee. And I had invited two extra people to come attend the uh, defense. And I just go by my office briefly first thing in the morning. I open Journal of Geophysical Research. 
And oh my God, my entire thesis has been scooped by a group at the University of Michigan. We knew nothing about them, of course, because nobody was in this field. And uh, there was a paper with five authors, many of them very august people. Um, and they had basically done what I'd done for my doctorate. They didn't do it as well or as thoroughly. But they had done it, and they, got, they published. And that made my thesis unpublishable. But it also, there were some mistakes in it. Some things I'd done that McElroy had in the program I had used of his when I did work on the outer planets for him uh, the summer between college and graduate school and also came back at Christmas to finish it up. There's a paper which I believe is Don Donahue and McElroy, it might be McElroy and Donahue, on the ionospheres of the outer planets. All the work is mine, all the writing was theirs and they were not quite so gracious as to throw me in as the third author. Uh, they, but they acknowledged me, and that was kind of good enough for the time being. Uh, is this professor at, uh, Harvard. at Harvard, absolutely. And, and I was off at Rice, but I'd come back and finish the work up at any rate. Um, some of you may even know Richard Stolarski. Richard Stolarski was in a group at the Johnson Space Flight Center working on the environmental effects of the space shuttle. Uh, and he was an expert in my field. And so uh, a man on my committee had gone to work in that group. And this is detailed in the oral history. Uh, and I'm so glad it is because the man who helped me get to the Johnson Space Flight Center two days a week was named Bob Rundle. And Bob, oh my goodness, Bob was just enormously helpful. He basically got the group at Johnson to pay for $5,000 of my postdoc, just out of the blue, on the condition that I would come to Johnson two days a week. We lived, Rice is up in the southeast, south, well, I can't remember, I guess it's southeastern corner of Houston, and uh, the Johnson Space Flight Center is more than a 30-minute drive. Um, but Bob still lived up near Rice, and so he said, and not only that, you'll ride with me. We had dropped down to one car, and uh, so I hopped in his car, he picked me up, and we had a lovely time driving to and fro to Johnson. Um, and Stolarski took me in hand, we fixed the mistakes that had been in my calculations in my model, he helped me rewrite my thesis paper, still didn't get published, and then we wrote a paper together on the photoelectrons the, uh, coming off the ionosphere of Venus. And Rich was an incredible partner. Um, what happened then was he and Bob Hudson, who also came here to University of Maryland, um, and, well, first to Goddard, actually, that uh, he and they could see that the end was coming. There, there was at most one more year left to write this environmental effects statement, and that was pretty routine. The key work had been done. Um, the SIAP program, which was the first ozone depletion program and was run out of, I want to say, the Federal Aviation Administration, uh, was ending its three-year term, and NASA had the lead in the stratosphere. And not only the lead, it pretty much came to have about 80% of the money in stratospheric research in the world, which made it amazingly powerful in that area. Annie uh, Nelson Spencer, who was the lab chief for the Laboratory for Planetary Atmospheres, wanted to form a stratosphere research group here at Goddard and did. And he brought Bob in to be the branch head, and he brought Rich in to be the star modeler, and they offered Bob Rundle a chance to come and be on the staff, uh, and he would have had to build a new, you know, molecular atomic physics lab, and he had done that too many times already, and so he declined. And when he declined, I got offered to come to Goddard with everybody. I'd applied for an NRC postdoc to do planetary atmospheres with um, Dick Hartle, blessed Dick Hartle. Uh, and the deal was that I would come to Goddard and get this, get this NRC postdoc, provided I did not do any work with Descartes on the ionosphere of Venus, 
but would switch over and be part of the stratosphere group. And of course, I, that was like throw me in the briar patch. I really preferred to do the socially relevant work on the stratosphere instead of the socially irrelevant work on Venus. Um, and that's not to say it's bad work, but it's just I really like, you know, think of it. This is, this is like 1976, you know, and being committed to doing good works and stuff was a really nice motivator. We were coming off all the protests about the war in Vietnam, et cetera. So it was a pretty heady time in that respect, and the stratosphere was about as hot as it got in terms of social relevance in the physical or sciences. So that's how I got to Goddard. And let's see. I did that. Uh, we got here in 76. I did it into 78, um, trying to publish like mad. And I came to several realizations. One is, I was a good yeoman scientist. I was no star. Uh, Rich could run circles around me in terms of coming up with ideas, and I ran circles around him in terms of doing work, which meant I was desperately trying to publish more often, and he was, he got his golf handicap down to two, and it, we, it, it was a source of tension. Uh, a man named George Newton, who was here, and who in all honesty, I must admit, Rich and I and Bob Hudson, we sort of formed a, an in-group along with Bill Heaps. And um, we didn't have a whole lot of respect for many of our colleagues in the Laboratory for Planetary Atmospheres. And George Newton had been on detail the NASA headquarters. And lo and behold, he got hired. So he got to be, and he was GS-15, or I guess he got promoted. And then he got promoted fairly quickly to what today is the Senior Executive Service. And I went, holy cow. You know, if George can make that much progress that fast, what am I doing here? And uh, I felt like, that, let's put it this way, that there were more uh, cards in my deck than just being a yeoman researcher. So his detail to NASA headquarters was open, and I, violating all the things anybody would tell you to do career-wise here at Goddard, went to my branch head, Bob, and said, I want to go. I want Newton's, I want Newton's detail to headquarters. And he consulted with Nelson Spencer, who confirmed that I was not really very important to the future mission of his laboratory, uh, that I was completely expendable and I could certainly go. At which point I headed off part-time to NASA headquarters, uh, two days a week, but as I just told my wife on the way over here, that was a two-day-a-week detail for sitting at headquarters. There were two more days doing headquarters work at Goddard, and the fifth day was spent telling everybody at Goddard what headquarters was thinking, because everybody wanted to know what Shelby Tilford was thinking. And there was a wonderful transition moment, so that instead of being detailed to space science at headquarters, I was detailed to the Office of Application. Shelby had just come across to head a new branch at headquarters um, to deal with all the atmosphere research. In the, and there was also an oceanography branch headed by Stan Wilson and um, in a division called Environmental Observations. So here I am, this two-day-a-week detailee. Office space is short. I'm detailed to Shelby. There's a spare desk in the corner of his office. So they put me at the spare desk in the corner of his office, and within two months I had a mentor for most of the rest of my scientific career. Uh, working with Shelby was amazing. He was just phenomenal, um, and I probably can't take enough time to do him justice in talking about all the wonders. But I do remember that when he'd been ousted, that his successor said no one had organized such a research program of such extensive impact and quality as he had, which was a pretty good thing for this man to say. He was a, his second wife was a psychiatrist, and I think he talked to her every night because he dealt masterfully with the psychiatric and psychological portions of this transition because, you know, basically virtually all of us were extremely loyal to Shelby. And yet, this man came in and did the job. My responsibilities initially were supposed to be 
working for Shelby, so they were across all the atmosphere stuff, the climate stuff, the severe, severe weather, the weather, and, and ozone and tropospheric air quality. But pretty quickly, they assigned me to go over to the oceanography group, which, you know, the sort of atmosphere people didn't think was really getting its act together very well. They were wrong. But Stan Wilson was over there, and he ran things quite differently. And um, Stan taught me ocean remote sensing, satellite oceanography. And I never forgot, and it's laced into the Earth observing system, for sure, even though it's not always such an easy fit, because as I'm sure most of you realize, altimeters that measure the, you know, the surface circulation of the ocean uh, have to be on fairly lean and mean satellites uh, flying at a different altitude so there's less atmospheric drag so that they can make a two centimeter accuracy measurement of the distance from the satellite to, depending on the wind, a three to I think eight kilometer circle on the surface. Two centimeters from space. Holy cow. And it goes on like that. In any case, during this period of time, uh, working at Goddard and then beginning to work at headquarters, well, actually, during the time mostly working at, at, head, at Goddard, uh, but this two-day-a-week detail at the headquarters, um, Susan and I hosted a support group for people who had adopted hard-to-place children. Uh, they were interracial adoptions or adoptions of children with severe health problems, uh, and in one case, both. One of the families uh, had adopted seven boys, and every one of them had a major health problem. Um, quite something. A variety of things happened, but one of the other parents was a man named Tom Moss. Tom was in, among the first congressional science fellows of the American Physical Society, and had stayed on, and was just amazingly competent, and was basically moving up the line in the staff of the House Science Committee. Uh, when the Congressional Science Fellowship Program started, there were only three PhD scientists in the entire staff of the House. By the time I got there in 1979-80, there were subcommittees of the Science Committee with five PhD scientists, often physicists, that they had acquired by hanging on to Congressional Science Fellow after Congressional Science Fellow. So, uh, knowing Tom, opened the door for me to, to decide to apply to be a Congressional Science Fellow. First year, I only applied to the American Geophysical Union, and then my application wasn't very good, and I didn't even get an interview. But the next year, for the 1979-80 year, I uh, wrote better. And um, it was also a, a transition there in writing better. I was a crappy writer. I mean, in college, I took an expository writing class required of everybody, and I got a C. And the graduate, no, actually the law student who taught us, was very good at pointing out the failures in my writing and had no idea telling me how to fix them. And so I retained that relatively poor writing style until somehow, magically, with the idea of word processing, I became a good writer and remained one, because that's when my, my career shifted from being somebody who could program well to being somebody who could write and edit very well. Uh, there's another skill that I'll bring up a little later, but that's what I did. And um, when I applied, uh, American Physical Society was really not very happy that year. They had Normally, they'd had two fellows every year, and until the year before me, they had always had two or three alternates, and all of their alternates had been selected by other societies, such as the AAAS. And the year before me, they'd only had two fellows um, and no backups. And I was told, I was the fourth of the four interviewees, and I was subsequently told that before I walked in the door, they didn't think they were going to have anybody. I mean, which I, I hope I'm not telling it to somebody who was one of the other people who had applied. I don't know who they were. But I showed up 
And they went to great lengths to tell me I really was good enough, even though I was sort of, you know, the only port in a storm. Um, but it was quite something. And the acceptance call was also interesting. Um, uh, the woman was on the staff at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, and she called up and said, well, you know, there were, there were several former fellows on the selection committee, and they insisted that I tell you that with shorter hair, my hair at the time was on my shoulders, and by the way, it should never have been on my shoulders. I have really stringy, lousy hair for wearing it that long. Um, but with shorter hair and a somewhat more trim beard, um, and you could tell this woman was just in deep trepidation for having to, you know, basically saying this, that a committee, there was an assumption, that a committee would feel more comfortable using me with the public. And I just told her, yeah, I'll get my hair cut. And I did. And, uh, uh, you know, I basically went from, our third child was born on a Friday, and I went from looking like a, a hippie, you know, kind of, beard, long hair, whatever, to looking like I walked into a hair cuttery on the morning of, I was going to pick Susan and the baby up from the hospital and said, make me look like a congressional staffer, and the guy did. And so all of a sudden, I looked like a congressional staffer. I looked at the reflect, my reflection in the, you know, in the glass windows of the stores as I left, and I thought, I'm going to have to lose some weight to look like I fit this haircut, you know. <laughs> and I didn't, but it, it was a whole transition in appearance and in what I was doing. And um, Congressional Science Fellowship, I had no intention of going to the Science Committee. What a waste. They had so many scientists already, they didn't need anybody. And so I went, I interviewed, you know, I think, at least five offices on the Senate side, including one with a senator who was the worst senator in the entire United States Senate, and who the Senate Employment Office would have not even listed opportunities in his office if they could have avoided it, but they couldn't. He was just a disaster, and he was from Virginia, and he did not win re-election. I'm not even sure if he ran. But at any rate, I didn't like the Senate. They were too huffy for me. I don't know why. I should have fit right in to that kind of environment, but I didn't. And so I concentrated on the House, and after eight different interviews, I got down to three choices. Uh, the three choices were Andy McGuire, who represented part of Bergen County, and he was part of that class of 74, remember, post-Watergate, when all there were like 105 freshmen, and he was one of them. Uh, then the other person was uh, somebody young, a young, a young congressman from Tennessee named Al Gore, Jr., uh, and last but not least, a man named David Obey. Obi may not be a household name to you, but if you talk to people who've been on the Hill, Obi casts a long shadow. He wrote, or he chaired the panel that wrote the House Ethics Rules that ultimately removed the speaker. Which is pretty amazing, you know, when you get down to it. And also a, a, a Democratic whip. So, Tip O'Neill, after retiring from the House, was interviewed on NPR. And he said these words, which I remember hearing on my car radio. Well, yeah, Dave, he did a great job for me. He chaired the ethics committee. It cost him any chance to be speaker. That's a lot to give up. So in uh, any case, I went to the man who was about to take over running our program, running the Congressional Science Fellowship Program at AAAS, and I asked for his advice. And he said, well, Andy McGuire, you know, Harvard government, PhD, really smart guy, which in the 1979-80 was not a compliment necessarily. Being smart was not viewed with great admiration. Hence, you know, you see people like Wilbur Mills, you know, being act, act, treated like he was just some country bumpkin, Rhodes Scholar and all, you know, that kind of thing was what went on. At any rate, he said, Andy McGuire, yep. You know, his name as a co-sponsor will cost you 25 votes on the floor of the House. And he was so unpopular because people didn't like his being smart and letting you know that he was smart. And then he said, well, Al Gore. He said, you know, Al Gore, he's a sophomore congressman. He will get his act together. Future tense. And then he looked at me and said, if Dave O'Be will have you, you go there. I made my way back to Opie's office. 
Um, turned out I'd interviewed already, and they were more than happy to have me. I was the only physical scientist in Dave's entire career who was ever a fellow in his office. He had lots of life science scientists, did a lot of stuff with health policy, uh, hated NASA because, you know, in northern, northwestern Wisconsin, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of NASA business or a whole lot of reason to pay attention to it, and he was very much into the social side of the government and uh, doing good things about health care, et cetera. And um, that didn't give him a love of our agency. And when I left his office and was coming back to NASA at my going away party, he said, you know, it was nice to know that something good could come from NASA. I sort of blanched when he said that, but went on. It was a transformative experience working in his office. It taught me about coalition building. We came within 12 votes of changing the budget resolution that was coming through the House to a, a, a more progressive one. That was pretty amazing, and it acquired an enormous number of different lobbyists from very different communities, from the people who worked on paving roads to the people who were the tobacco industry. But we got them all together, uh, and that was quite amazing. The other thing that was remarkable is Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, LIHEAP. Um, Russell Long in the Senate had put in, I believe, the windfall profits tax legislation, a formula that put a lot of money on this program that was meant for heating and helping people pay their heating bills into helping to pay air conditioning bills in Louisiana, as you might well suspect. I could never figure out his formula, but on behalf of Tip O'Neill telling Obi, I took on the job of coming up with a different formula. And I did. And I could beat Russell Long in the Senate without even thinking, because I could get a formula that had 68 Senate votes if you voted your narrow self-interest. And I couldn't get it to be a majority in the House to save my soul. At which point, Bob Michael, Republican leader, of the House of Representatives at the time, uh, was a member of the subcommittee, the Labor, Health and Human Services Education Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee. And there were two more appropriators from Illinois, and even a second one on the, on the subcommittee. And with my formula, the state of Illinois would go down from $80 million to 79. And he decided they could forego a million dollars to be in solidarity with the northern tier states. And so we had a formula fight, a vote on the floor of the House, and we won. Because Bob Michael brought across the Illinoisans, and that gave us the votes we needed to win by like 12 votes. Russell Long took one look at what we passed and sent over to the Senate and knew we had him. So he came up with a compromise. It was a $1.8 billion appropriation. He said, well, look, let's add $300 million to this appropriation, and we'll make it so that every state gets what they were going to get under my formula or what they were going to get under the House formula, whichever is larger. And that's what happened. When I returned to Capitol Hill as, and the appropriation staff in 2003, I was introduced as the guy from the LIHEAP formula. You know, PhD physicist and all, right? They are hopefully because of my science background. And what was I known for? A welfare formula. It only lasted about one more year, but from, you know, 1980 to 2004 is a long time for a formula to remain stable. Anyway, and I think that's a, a kind of nice thing. So, all right, I came back from my fellowship, all my job possibilities. Uh, had vanished with the, um, a combination of the election in 1980 of Ronald Reagan. And there was also, Mr. Obie was running for chairman of the House Budget Committee. And in an ironic set of circumstances, which I won't take the time to detail, he lost. And so I couldn't get a job working for him on the Hill. And the Senate had flipped, so I didn't have a job with the Senate Commerce Committee. And I put my tail between my legs, literally, and came back that Shelby Tilford at NASA headquarters and said, Shelby, please help. At which point, I went on full-time detail from Goddard 
to headquarters to nominally be the advanced planner for the Earth Observations, excuse me, Environmental Observations Division. And a variety of things happened, but after, well, basically, it took the new administration uh, till the late fall of 1981 to finally appoint a new NASA administrator, deputy administrator, and let the people who were held over and acting go. And the held over and acting had directly affected me because the administrator had resigned, the deputy administrator was acting administrator, they picked the associate administrator for um, applications um, to be the acting deputy, so his deputy had to be acting for him. They picked the division director I was reporting to to act as his deputy, and that meant this man's deputy needed to be our division director, even though Shelby Tilford was clearly the person who should have been doing it. But they couldn't do that uh, for a variety of bureaucratic reasons. So lo and behold, all of a sudden I had a job working for somebody, and nobody told me that he'd tried to be the division advance planner six months before I got there and had failed miserably, which did not make his view of me all that positive in terms of what I was supposed to do. Uh, and it just about killed me. It was just awful work year. What he wanted, I didn't want to do, and I wasn't very good at, because what he wanted just was sort of like a military staff officer. He prided himself on not having much paper in his office, and he expected there, me, therefore, to keep track of all the paper. Well, those of you who know me very well know that that's probably not the wisest decision. I'm not a great paper keeper together. So, at any rate, what eventually happened is new administrator, reorganization. All the clutter gets cleared out. The man who'd been my boss became the deputy of the Life Sciences Division, the smallest division in space science. And lo and behold, Shelby Tilford was now my boss. Um, he didn't want me to do a lot of advanced planning, which he didn't exactly tell me, but um, we were working on selling TOPEX and the Upper Atmosphere Research Satellite, which had an, an unusual new start in two pieces, one in 82 and one in 85. In this organiza reorganization, for some reason, our division, Shelby's division, got the Solar Terrestrial Theory Program. At Rice, I had been forced to switch from physics department to the space science department, which then renamed itself the space physics and astronomy department, not because of me. Um, that had added one requirement to my coursework, namely I needed to take the year-long course in plasma physics. So we go f flash forward, all of a sudden solar terrestrial theory program, an amazing program is our responsibility, and only one person in Shelby's division had ever had plasma physics, and that was me. So I was given it to manage, and I went from basically being somebody they weren't even sure they wanted to hire anymore at headquarters to a masterful program manager. It just happened naturally. I went and visited 12 of the 14 investigations. These were all pretty, for theory, they were pretty elite. And one of them was at the University of New Hampshire, a former Goddard employee named Leonard Fisk. Len went from being an assistant professor with no tenure to the vice president for research and management of the University of New Hampshire in something like five years. He was my second largest grantee. He had a theory grant of, sounds like a lot of money even still, $300,000 that he was getting to do this. He had an excellent group. He clearly ran it well. Uh, and we pretty much bonded. He became the person in this community, which I really wasn't a part of, who I would turn to for advice, for technical understanding, et cetera. And Len was just amazing. He was a gifted manager as well as a gifted scientist. And that started a, a nice thing. So all of a sudden, you know, that's, that, that was a nice relationship. And uh, then Lynn became Shelby's boss. He became the associate administrator. So all of a sudden, I was working for one mentor who was then working for another mentor. So I had two mentors stacked up. Uh, and Shelby actually put up with the fact that I sometimes would go around him and just go talk to Lynn. But the main thing is that because of the Solar Terrestrial Theory Program, 
Lynn Fisk and I understood what a major, if you will, computer modeling and data analysis segment of a program could be and in our science should be. Far bigger than the Solar Terrestrial Theory program. So we invented the interdisciplinary investigations of the Earth Observing System. I thought maybe we could have 15 of them, 10 US and 5 foreign. My colleagues thought, ah, it's too modest. We ended up with 29 of them, 20 of them US only, and two more of them significant US co-principal investigators. So we were paying for 22 out of the 29. It was just amazing. And they became, they came to be viewed, I think a little unfortunately, but as the intellectual brain trust of the Earth Observing System. So when it came time to downsize the payloads, they basically sat at the table and made recommendations, and the poor experimentalists, who were wonderful, and whose grants, by and large, were usually much larger, sat around the perimeter and kind of watched their fate as to whether they got to stay on or not. In the fullness of time, Bert Edelson becomes the associate administrator. And Bert's not one to let people sit around, and a variety of things had happened, but now he was a person who, as a communications guy, thought the way to solve the overcrowding in the you know, equatorial arc where all the communication satellites was, was bare satellites. But he knew he couldn't sell a bigger satellite in the communications program, so he hit upon the idea of selling it in Earth science. So he turned to Tip uh, Pit Dome, excuse me, he turned to Pit Dome, who was now having sort of a, a headquarters front office staff position uh, so it could be eliminated in a year and he could get early retirement. They told him, Pitt, I want you to take a look at large satellites, large space platform, with an Earth observations payload that spans Earth observations, all, all the disciplines. A group of 10 was put together. I was its you know, executive secretary, the second most junior person on the group, and uh, we started. And we uh, were at a second meeting at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and we spent our first day teaching each other about what our subsets of Earth science needed uh, and wanted in a, in a, on a, such a major satellite. But we couldn't gel. I mean, there was just no way of pulling this together. We didn't see the way. I went back to my hotel that night, woke up early in the morning, having not really gotten over the jet lag time shift, and it came to me. Water was what connected every discipline in earth science, even the geophysics. And with that, I began to sketch out a platform payload of six instruments. And when we reconvened as the second most junior person in the room, I swallowed very hard and was somewhat scared and said, well, I got to present this. So I presented it. And much to my astonishment, the people, the other nine members of the committee, and all of us were managers of one form or another, said, where's the rest of it? Not an objection. So that night I went back and came up with two more payloads. A total of 19 instruments constituted what we were doing. We then spent a couple of meetings get our, getting our view graphs ready, and Edelson took it to the administrator, Jim Beggs, who I believe had been his roommate at the Naval Academy. And I wasn't there when he presented it, but I was told the Beggs looked at him and said, stop trying to undermine my space station. And then he quietly said, as long as I don't read about it in a half week, you can keep going. And that was amazing. And I, it's always led me to believe that Jim Beggs was a closet environmentalist. He was certainly big in the Appalachian uh, Trail group. And he did a three-part interview with the Christian Science Monitor. And in the second of those interviews, it reveals a pretty pro-environment, environmentalist point of view. Okay, so that's where the Earth Observing System came from. Um, more reorganizations happened. Ultimately, all of our science was going to be under Shelby. Uh, and we had this idea. And I thought it was really an important idea. So I went to Shelby and said, Shelby, I'd like to continue to pursue this. Now, for all I know, Edelson had already told him, you will keep doing this. So it may have been just you know, asking for something that was foregone. 
But I asked, and they let me be in charge of future planning. And I felt that because it had been an all in-house NASA plan, that it would not be accepted in the outside science committee community. So we started over. I've decided to start over with only, to the large extent, only outsiders. Uh, and I went to my colleagues in Shelby's division, who now included all the disciplines of Earth science, and I said, OK, I need somebody who will be on the planning group, who will be credible as a representative of your discipline. And crassly speaking, no assholes. <laughs> I wanted people who could get along with one another. Uh, they had to be credible as representatives of a field, but they had to be people who would behave well with one another. We started meeting. Much, again, to my surprise, they loved it. They loved the idea of interacting with the other people in our science across the board. It was just phenomenal. Um, and pretty soon, we had the first report of the science working group. Uh, and we talked people into changing the name from System Z to EOS. Um, EOS also not only is an acronym, but if you have only a, a prime, you know, only a leading capital letter, it is the name of a Greek goddess, who is uh, the god of the dawn and mother of the four winds. Well, we needed to get the people who did electrophoresis operations in space as an experiment on the space shuttle, had trademarked EOS. So, hmm. Well, my oldest at this point was uh, somebody who was, had become a real expert on Greek myths. And grabbing his doliers, I went and basically said, well, EOS, acronym, capital E, little o, little s, Greek goddess, clearly different use. Where whereupon EOS became EOS. Um, subsequently, the NASA lawyers figured out that Earth Science actually had prior use of EOS in all caps, uh, and so the trademark was not valid. But that was years later. Anyway, so my you know, fourth grade son helped us rename a satellite, or get a satellite named, which I always love. And he did too, for that matter. The Challenger blew up. Uh, the Bretherton Committee had been commissioned to sort of run parallel with the planning committee for EOS and to deal with sort of the intellectual and the science. They had not insisted that everybody be nice, uh, and people were a little more turfy on that committee. But they were wonderful people, and they tended to be more highfalutin members of the community. And Bretherton did a masterful job of working with them. But part of that masterful job was to come up with the idea that this needed to be a NASA NOAA both payloads to get the operational satellite instruments improved at the same time as providing the new Earth Science NASA instruments. Whoa. Bill Townsend, who I'm sure many of you know, or at least some of you may remember, told me point blank that this was a risk and that we needed to fix that, but we didn't do that for quite a while. Uh, so I was meeting with my, my NOAA colleagues on the, in the old NASA headquarters behind the, you know, behind the green doors on the seventh floor. And somebody stuck their head in our room and said, the Challenger just blew up. And Noah, you know, we almost couldn't believe it, but we got up to go into a conference room on that floor, administrator's floor, and realized, oh my God. The Noah people realized this was for us a death in the family. And they just left, which was the appropriate thing to do out of courtesy to us. And basically, everything slowed down for three years. It caused a three-year delay in the Earth observing system. We had been aiming, ultimately, at a, 1975, a 1995 launch. It had slipped to 96. Ultimately, it went to 99. But Challenger had an enormous impact. And given that we were doing research on a changing climate, getting to space with the comprehensive observation sooner seemed a lot better than later, but we couldn't pick up any urgency. I mean, the agency was just in a mess, and that mess continued. So, uh, by the way, the Bretherton Committee came up with Earth System Science, 
or the study of Earth as a system. And that para what gave it substance and budgetary weight was the Earth observing system. And in the end of the day, you could almost argue the Earth observing system was a budget line. We ultimately saved Landsat. We funded, and people don't realize it, but we funded, I think, Jason's one and two, the two successors to Topex. Uh, and there were EOS instruments on all kinds of different places. So NASA tends to not like to use the EOS label, except on the data system. But you know, a huge number of the satellites were actually EOS satellites. They were part of the plan, which included an altimeter and a scatterometer. Uh, we deferred synthetic aperture radar to the foreign partners, none of whom would give up on having their own SAR. So we, I just said, look, we don't need to do that. And then something strange happened. This is his tale. Um, Barbara Mikulski, as you know, extremely influential, influential on the Appropriations Committee. She went out to visit the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The center director, even though he had been involved in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, did not choose to host her. He turned her over to a man who was now at JPL, but who had been at Goddard. And Mikulski did not like that. And that created an opportunity to get NOAA off the EO spacecraft. And it also guaranteed that the lead role would come to Goddard. Even though there was clearly the data system was a big challenge, and JPL was better equipped to do the data system challenge. They claimed they weren't. They, they deferred it to Goddard and protected JPL being the planetary center of NASA. It was their choice. They still play big roles in Earth, Earth observations and continue to. But that's how Goddard got the uncontested lead in the program. So if a senator on your appropriations committee is coming to visit your installation, and I would say also a member of the House, you better treat them nice and the senator director better be the one who welcomes them and pays due homage. One of the things I got to do was lead our negotiations with the Earth Observations Offices and Met Agencies of the Space Station Partners. So I had these wonderful trips to Canada, the European Union, and Japan. And we coordinated the announcements of opportunity for, for EOS. Um, the Japanese became wonderful partners. Um, didn't work out so well because their satellites were not as good as they should have been. But we flew things with them, and they were always supportive. The Europeans, well, were faced with an odd problem. Canada was an associate member of the European Union, and yet they were given a seat at the table. And all the bigger funders in Europe, like the Germans and the French, and the Brits and the Italians, were all begrudging of this Canadian seat at the table, which they didn't get. And a lot of various things happened, but there was a lot of competing. Even worse, as we tried to pursue a very open data policy, you know, no more than the marginal cost of reproduction and delivery is a charge for data, they were resistant. Why were they resistant? Because the agencies that funded the Earth Observations Program at the European Space Agency were not the MET agencies. They were not the agencies that consumed the data. And so they were looking for ways to force the consuming parts of the same cabinet to chip over money to them. So it was really an in-country fight in each of these countries. And we never got a good data policy out of that activity. But we did coordinate. Uh, we had some nice friendships. We had some lovely meetings. And uh, Lord, I never knew I'd be an international diplomat. Uh, I even on one occasion, you know, because of this data system tension, I actually led the U.S. delegation to walk out of a meeting at ESA headquarters, and I basically called Lynn Fisk, and he told me I'd done the right thing, and you know we somehow got things cleared up and went back to the meeting after a break. But uh, that was pretty dramatic to do. You know, how does how does this person uh, with my background end up? doing that kind of stuff, but I did. How does a person, you know, if you, I couldn't get elected dog catcher in high school. 
you know, I, uh, I was not somebody who viewed himself as a person who sells. But I believed in what we were doing. I believed in it, and I communicated that whenever I talked. And so the other skill I discovered I had besides writing was marketing, you know, because that's what you're doing when you're selling a satellite mission. And what I really was was almost like a tent revival preacher. I mean, uh, when I gave, finally was invited to Goddard to give the talk pre-New Start on the Earth Observing System, I turned to Bill Heaps afterwards because I didn't have a sense of how it gone and said, and Bill's kind of a Texas cowboy by manner, even though he's really a multi-generational physicist in his family. Uh, I said, Heaps, what'd you think? He said, it was pretty good. He said, at the end, I sort of thought the Mormon Tabernacle Choir should have been singing America the Beautiful, <laughs> at which point I knew I had them, you know, and it was fortunate. Um, Anyway, so that was all good. Now, let's see. We had to downsize, and I could talk about that to some degree. Uh, but I will say there came to be a moment. Uh, we were meeting at UC San Diego. Chris Galise was there, and Marty Donahoe were there, who were the, respectively the systems engineer and the instrument person for all of the Earth observing system during its study phase. And Barbara Mikulski had hit upon cutting the budget from the new start of $17 million, million in the first 10 years to 13. And uh, we had to do something. And it had been pointed out that it was pretty risky to put everything on one big platform. If it went in the drink, we were screwed. So with my okaying the choices they made scientifically, Chris and Marty took the big platform, broke it up into three medium medium-sized satellites, and we called them AM, PM, and CHEM, um, Terra, Aqua, Aura, and that's what ultimately got built and flown. They reconfigured the mission overnight. It's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. We get to uh, 1996, no, 1995, and there's pressure to consolidate divisions and headquarters and to get rid of a lot of support contractors and one thing or another. So I end up having to compete with uh, Mike Luther to be in charge of the, the flight missions and stuff. And um, they choose Mike. They were right. He was a better, far better choice for that particular job. And um, I went off looking after the idea of a federation uh, and uh, working on a federation of data systems. And that came into being. And Martha Maiden, after I left uh, NASA headquarters, Martha Maiden took over that job and turned it into a wonderful federation that exists today. I went off after a year of that to the GLOBE program. And I can't tell you how much I love that program. It basically, for those of you who don't know, involves K through 12 kids all over the world taking research quality environmental measurements. By research quality, what I mean is that they can be quantitatively compared over space and time, which is what we do in our science with only one Earth. That's what we have no choice but to do. So the kids can take the measurements, and at the same time, they're supposed to have an improved STEM education experience and raise environmental awareness in their communities. Um, as the chief scientist of the program, I tended to err on the side of taking the data and worrying more about that than anything else. There came a time when NASA had to take over for its hauling zeroed the funding for the program at NOAA. So NASA had to take over being the lead agency, which also meant I ended up taking over as the head, not just the chief scientist. And um, any rate, that um, was something. And then to check a box with the White House NASA decided it needed to privatize GLOBE, really meaning spin it off into a cooperative agreement. And it ended up being the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research won that competition. They commenced to do a mediocre job that slowly was tearing the program down, but very slowly. It took a long, long, long time before it was arrested, and there was still a program, credibly, uh, after that. And um, 
as I thought, I went to the hill. I, miracle of miracles, I was about to come to Goddard and be parked in a corner. I got back from a trip dealing with Globe, and there was a message on my phone. The man who had been my staff director on OB staff as a congressional science fellow was calling to offer me a position on the House Appropriations staff, which I took. Democrats were in the minority. It was fine by me. It made it easier. I was bowled over by the quality of people on that staff. They were and are phenomenally good. And all of a sudden, I was the clerk, Democratic clerk, minority clerk, for the Energy and Water Subcommittee of Appropriations. I got to learn all kinds of things about nuclear weapons that had fascinated me since I was an eight-year-old. And um, I learned a lot. Uh, Democrats took the majority. That didn't work out so well for me. It made me the clerk. And I wasn't all that experienced. I kept the existing staff because they were, rather bluntly, all more liberal than I was. I mean, it was sort of, in, in terms of political spectrum, the Republican clerk, me, and the three professional staffers, who were all, except on gender issues, uh, more liberal than I am. So um, working with them was not pleasant, rather bluntly. They didn't have any respect for me, which I had not realized when they'd just been colleagues and I'd been on the other side. But as their boss, it wasn't very pleasant. Um, we put together a good bill. We had some good hearings. Uh, we were in the process of doing conference. And lo and behold, I wasn't paying a lot of attention as cal a callus on my foot turned into gangrene. And ultimately, I was out of there. And I was in the hospital when Mr. Obi called me and um, said, we're not going to do much this next year. Take the year and get well. And I did. And I really wasn't able to come back full time to take, or at least enough full time to work on an account until from December until the following September. But then I did. And then they graciously moved me over to the Commerce Justice Science Committee, which subcommittee, which funds NASA and NOAA. So the woman funding NOAA is sitting next to me. And I knew more about her agency on everything but fisheries than she did. And former colleagues from Globe called me into a luncheon and basically said, it's not going well. We need to do something. And we did. We added money to the NOAA appropriation uh, for 2010, I believe, uh, three million bucks. And that gave NOAA a seat at the table. NOAA shook NASA's cage. And NASA, in the process of waking up, said, wait a minute. This website, it's a great 1990s website. But it's 2008, 2009. 2010, what are we doing? So they, they began to use the extra money from NOAA uh, to replace some of their money and divert the NASA money to starting a process of revising the website, turning the program around, forced UCAR to fire the director, uh, and moved forward. And it worked. We would have gotten, if it had worked for Joe Manchin, $2 million more million the next year, but he wouldn't vote for the appropriation. And so it ended up being a continuing resolution, and no more money came. But the difference had been made. The turnaround in the GLOBE program began. And rather bluntly, um, when Democrats lost the House, I was no longer a clerk. And so I went into retirement. And 10 weeks later, I started as a consultant part-time on the GLOBE program for NASA. And it's been wonderful, 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 wonderful. And um, in, last thing I'll say, in 2014, uh, Ming Ying Wei, for whom I was really a consulting advisor at NASA headquarters, I had mentioned the idea that, well, maybe I should start a nonprofit that could somehow support GLOBE or whatever. And I'd also come to believe that GLOBE's number one objective should be improving science education that getting the data was good, but improving science education was more critical. And in 2014, Ming, look, Ming Yang looked at me at a meeting and said, just looked over at me and said, so when are you going to do that? When are you going to start that thing? So I realized the fat was in the fire. And I began to start something, which I was introduced as the president of the 
youth learning as citizen environmental scientists. It may not make much of an acronym, but it's exactly what we're into. That when kids do science, and I'm talking like third through 12th graders, but it also applies up, up beyond that. If they do science, they learn science. If they don't do science, they don't learn science. It's not just a bunch of facts. It's a whole mental process. And it's a mental process you carry, in, you carry through your life just like the ability to write or the ability to understand human society. So that's what science education needs to be about. And lo and behold, we started it in 2014. Uh, we've now been doing it for five and a half years. I have brochures up here if anybody wants one. Uh, I also I have ones about if you want to give money. I have other ones that if you know a school who, where there's a teacher or an informal edu you know, environmental center or something where they might need some equipment, that's what Wide Laces does is it makes equipment grants. It also sponsors what we call student research symposia where students come and present their scientific projects. It's not a science fair. It's not a competition. It's not searching for the best and brightest. It is letting students, often very average, normal, just regular garden variety students who have done earth science research projects to present their work. And the first people they present their work to are each other. They get to be the scientist. It's peer to peer. Now, they're still kids, so we bring in some adult STEM types to give them some pointers and some feedback, but it's not a competition. It's improving everybody. It's very mutual. And uh, the funding for it looked like it was going to be only half of what they needed in 2019, so we stepped in with the other half. 2019 came off well. 2020 planning is advancing quickly. Uh, NASA has put more money into it unexpectedly, which is wonderful. And we're still making up the rest. And we intend to make sure that it continues as long as it's beneficial. So those are the big things Wild Laces does. But we'd also like to really try and move out in the state of Maryland to systemically change the science curriculum to include research projects. Uh, there is no state in the United States that is better equipped. You have environmental sites, 42 of them spread around the state. You have a graduation requirement for a meaningful watershed experiment, experience to which we need to add actually taking measurements, not just staring at the watershed. And um, I'm optimistic that if we can raise enough money, we'll be able to push to doing it statewide in Maryland. And if any of you know a school and want to mentor that school, mentor a teacher, just be helpful, go in and talk, whatever, please consider. And uh, there are people here at, on the Goddard campus who can talk to you. Uh, Dorian Janney and uh, Todd Toth can help point you in the right direction if you don't know of any schools to do that. But uh, you'd be more than welcome and everybody would be grateful. So enough from me. I don't know if there's any time I gather from people walking out that I'd probably run over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so.